The link in the description is only there to see the source material. Do not under any circumstance go to these people with the intent to be a dick. I don't support witch hunts or lynch mobbing, so don't be either. As for the subjects themselves, my video is for the purposes of criticism and entertainment. Take care and leave it. My content is not here to start drama. Please do not treat it like it is. Days like these are perfect days for a commentary on someone who's been in my sights for a handful of months now. <laughs> well, well, well. Thanks, my dude. So, to give context, today's target is Toro, a commentator who's been around for quite some time, but no one seems to know. I've seen her here and there, but due to her videos being kind of alright, fairly mediocre, I've never had any reason to pay her any mind. <laughs> Until today, of course. So let's take a step back. Rants and Reviews is a YouTuber who does, well, rants and reviews. Primarily on original characters. DeviantArt tweet, basically. We can hear Ponder fangasming in the distance. Any hooters? r, &R did a video reviewing pretty much every OC a quote TV user by the name of Vampire Princess created. And that's basically all the context we needed. Let's begin. As for the message itself, two of these paragraphs are pointless to have in disclaimer. The first isn't necessary because people are going to say whatever they want. You may not like it, but you can't control what people type. That's not the point of the first paragraph. The first paragraph is quite blatantly, I'd appreciate it if there wasn't a flame war, asking people to be respectful in the comments. Sure, technically she can't control what people say in the comment section, but then again, this is just a request. Actually, I'm keeping your logic on the back burner for a handful of seconds because this will quickly hit you back. The only way for you to do that is to disable the comment section, which is something I don't really recommend. Why not? The website gives you the ability to, it's a function that's there. Yeah, it pisses people off, but if you know you have a valid reason to, why the fuck does it matter? I do hope this isn't going to be a returning thing, else you're going to make my job tedious. That's not foreshadowing, is it? Is it? The third paragraph is just as pointless as the first. We don't care if you use art that isn't yours. If the art belongs to the person you're writing about, then it goes without saying. However, if you use art that has nothing to do with the person you're discussing, add the name of the artist to the piece, or give them credit in the description along with a link to the picture so people can enjoy the art. Once again, you're missing the point of the paragraph. r, &R is trying to point out there that she doesn't take credit for the art and isn't making money from said art, which anyone who has ever used art in a video, like, ever, can tell you that that's a common complaint that people often have towards video creators. So r, &R is just putting out there that all of the credit is going to the original artist, even if she doesn't explicitly name them in the video. Which I grant you should also go without saying, but you know, it's the internet, and if you try to idiot-proof something, they'll make a bigger idiot, so we have these disclaimers for that reason. So, out of the three, the second paragraph is the only one you need as a disclaimer. Don't use that stoner logic with me, Missy! What kind of backwards inconsistency are you placing down for us here? Paragraph 1 is useless because you can't control what people say, and paragraph 3 should go without saying, therefore it's pointless. But paragraph 2 says not to go and harass the person she's covering, which is both quote-unquote trying to control what people do and quote-unquote should go without saying, but yet that's the okay one. By her own logic, that should be the most pointless one in the three paragraphs. Alright, to explain further, let me lay it out. Using Toro's logic, you can't control what people do. If people want to harass whoever you're covering, they will. So therefore saying, don't harass the people I'm covering, is a useless paragraph. But it should also go without saying that you shouldn't harass people. At all. Be a decent human being, you know. So therefore, it's also useless by this logic. Also, to continue to clarify, no. I don't agree with this logic. I'm just pointing out how Toro's logic towards r, &R disclaimer is very inconsistent. There is no reason for it to be three paragraphs long. The last problem lies within the bottom left-hand corner. Granted, the screen matic logo is off to the side, but to me at least, it indicates that you don't have a video editor. Recorded with. Recorded with. She's just recording with Screencast-O-Matic, as in she could still edit with another program. My question to you is, how did you see recorded with Screencast-O-Matic and go, you know, maybe she doesn't have an editor? There's zero correlation. Shut up. Now, that said, you could say, yeah, screen recording isn't the best way to do this, as you could just chuck pictures in a movie maker and still have less of a sloppy result, and you'd be correct in saying that. But this? This just takes leaps in not making sense. And before anyone from either the alt-commentary community or neo-commentary community gets on my case for bringing up video editors... Wait, what? YouTube has no, no, go, go back. Don't continue editor. just after randomly it addressing things that way. Set. Where do you get off just pausing in the middle of the video just to address things that way? Oh yeah, I know the commentary community exists, so I'm just gonna address them like they're scum. 
But why, though? I get you're bringing up a hypothetical counter-argument to a claim. I have no issues there. Grant you I'm a bit confused on the counter-argument you're bringing up because who the fuck in the CC argues against video editors, but overall I get what you're doing. But why address just the community in such a way? That comes off as utterly spiteful and a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're practically begging someone to argue against something that isn't even incorrect. Also, you are aware the commentary community aren't the only people who can argue against that claim too, right? Like, anyone in the comments section can argue against that, so why specifically point it at commentators? I got a few guesses in mind, but none of them have you looking good. Beyond this point, you're going to see a lot of jump cuts and fast forwarding. That's me editing out a lot of pauses and pointless filler. Well shit, why didn't you start with that? Instead of pointing out her screen recording device, why didn't you just say she had a lot of pauses and pointless filler? Ironically, not getting straight to the point and just snarking at the CC in of itself causes a lot of confusion with pointless filler, so you're not at all subtracting from that. Try again. Now you're talking. Side note, making your audience guess who you're writing on is pointless. Especially when you put the person's name in your title. Hey Toro, have you ever heard of a rhetorical question? That too is rhetorical because obviously you haven't. Even in the context you cut, Arnar acknowledges that it's in the title of the video but sparks up the guessing game anyway so she can introduce the person she's covering to the audience. Okay, I want you I want you guys to have a guess at who I'm referring to, even though you've probably already read the title, seeing as you did click on this video. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. There are loads of OCs, they share a very similar name, and there are loads of unfinished fanfictions with this character. Still haven't got it? Vampire Princess. Look, I get she's stumbling her words, and I get she's obviously not using a script, and I also get that it's tedious to watch. Hell, getting that clip alone, I had to watch RR's video at least two times speed. But that's not unnecessary padding, that's introducing the target to the audience in an attempt to make it entertaining. Let's... let's start with this one, because, um... This is... this is what got me. <laughs> now, some of you may know that I really like Black Butler. I am one of those anime people where it's like, I also like the really cliche ones, and then then I like the ones that nobody else knows about, and Black Butler happens to be one of those animes that I happen to like. And trust me, I like them a lot. And Black Butler happens to be one of those animes that I happen to like. And trust me, I like them a lot. And trust me, I like them a lot. I like them a lot. Oh, really? I like Black Butler, too! William and Claude are the best waifus! Wait a minute, did I just use the term waifu? Oh god, I'm turning into weeb trash! No, you fucking normie! I'd be more upset that you didn't use the term husbando, you freak! Name, Sarah Rose. Age, 19. Right, I mean, there's a freaking 12-year-old, so why not? Species! Here's, here's my thing. She's a mermaid. A vampire, an angel, and a fairy hybrid. Like, I can see maybe a vampire. J just maybe. If it were to be in the right circumstances, and maybe in an AU, where instead of demons, there's vampires and all that. I don't know, something like that. An angel, I can see that, because, I mean, there's demons, why not have what's normally seen as to be the exact opposite? The angel part. It would have been great if she just, he, she, somebody, I guess. Um, I could see it if she were to just be an angel because that would make sense, but not all of this. Um, apparently she has the color of gills. Um, I don't know. Okay, so these are supposed to be the gills, which I guess it works for the fact that it's a mermaid. A mermaid, vampire, angel, fairy, hybrid, um... I, I don't know. I don't have that many things smushed together to create a character. I mean, really. Did the mermaid screw the vampire and then the angel screw the fairy high, the fairy and then those two abominations screw each other and out blew this thing or something? Toro, you're a dragon girl. All of this you're playing after the part you slowed down is not needed. This is more of that excess filler that you don't want in the video as this goes on for over a fucking minute. You get onto R&R's case for going over a minute with her intro, her fucking intro, only to later and drag the fuck out of R&R's context to a point you only touch on a little bit of. If you really, desperately needed that context, you could have sped up the entirety of that clip instead of slowed down the part that you did. Why did you make it sound like there are no angels in Black Butler? I know you didn't straight up deny it, but you could have said, 
It makes sense because there are angels in Black Butler. Even though the only ones we've seen are Ash and Angela, thanks to William, we know that there's more than two. Oh no, she didn't explicitly say that it's possible that it could be an angel because there are angels in Black Butler. Okay, two things. One, she didn't explicitly say it was impossible either. Hell, nor did she explicitly say that there are no angels in Black Butler. She did say that there were no vampires, fairies, and mermaids, so fuck the right off with your chicken and waffles. Because if her not explicitly saying it this way is a problem, then her not speaking in absolutes the other way is too a problem. And two, this doesn't invalidate her point. You do touch on more of her overall point as we'll see as we continue, but here you're pretty much strictly saying she's not wrong, which makes this part of the interjection pointless. Also, I can see vampires being a concept in Black Butler, especially since the story centers around death blood and dark themes. Everything that vampires were before they got raped by Stephanie Myers. But is there any evidence at all to prove that vampires exist in Black Butler? Just because a show has dark themes doesn't mean it has to have every single Transylvanian from historic fiction thrown in there. Fuck, let's look at an anime I do know, Fidopatsu Junshan. An anime that's dark and about depression, suicide, and death. By this backwardsy logic, that show could have a vampire in it, despite the fact that it takes place in modern Tokyo, and the most out there premise is are the Charger Girls, the main focus of the show themselves. If on the off chance vampires do exist in Black Butler, then you should provide evidence. Otherwise it just comes up as you assuming all dark shows are fucking Helsing. It doesn't seem like something that needs to be in an alternate universe. After all, Black Butler has demons, angels, and grim reapers. Vampires don't seem so out of place. But do they actually exist in universe, you dweebus? We can't go by what wouldn't be out of place. r and is criticizing it on the basis that apparently there is no vampire in Black Butler. Proof commentator, do you have it? The only one that would seem like a stretch is the mermaid part. Given that the mythical creature is known to be a dangerous monster, despite of how Hans Christian Andersen depicted them, this is the one that could have the slight chance of being in an alternate universe. Oh dear lord, you really are that stupid, aren't you? Okay, first of all, what about fairies? You do touch on them later, but those don't normally exist from what I can tell in Black Butler. You saying mermaids are the only ones that could exist in an AU is ignoring one-fourth of the problem. But overall, your point doesn't even seem to understand what an alternate universe even is. Anything can exist in an AU. Fuck, homosexual gingerbread man strippers that sound like Alfred Hitchcock could exist in a Black Butler AU. What the fuck is your point? Actually, if I can be blunt, that's how you would argue r and statement, because she straight up says fairies and mermaids are totally out of the realm of Black Butler, but excuses vampires in the case of an AU. Why wouldn't mermaids and fairies also potentially exist in an AU? What if this character comes from an AU where all four exist? Fan characters, while normally are written within the confines of the world that they're fan characters of so they can insert themselves within said world, there's nothing really saying that they can't be a part of an alternate universe. See Grim Tales for an example of this, a Billy and Mandy AU about the children of Mandy and Grimm. Come at me. I'm not saying that's what the character actually is, I'm just pulling up an actual argument against r and R statement. That said, you could also bring up how self-defeating this character being in a fan AU that changes that much is, given that at that point you could just write your own story at that rate. But, you know, let's bring up how you don't need to make an AU for anything but mermaids, because that makes sense. After doing research on mermaids, I found that there were quote-unquote sightings of the creature just a few years ahead of the Victorian era. But Black Butler is not just the Victorian era, it's a fictional world whose setting is in the Victoria era with demons, meaning these sightings maybe don't even exist in that world. I don't know how much I can actually stress this. To elaborate further, given that the history of Black Butler involves demons and angels and whatever else there is in Black Butler, the fact that there has been real life sightings becomes irrelevant to the conversation because this is historical fiction we're talking about here. You know, fiction, as in not like real life. Now a potential argument I could hear is, but if it's historical fiction, there could be mermaids, right? Well, yeah, there could be, but like vampires, are there any evidence that shows that they exist within the confines of the world of Black Butler? Given the fact that Toro is using real-life evidence for her claim against fiction, I'm gonna go with no, there isn't. So this character is still a problem within those confines, given that if it's supposed to take place in the actual Black Butler story, then its whole premise of it being a mermaid is faulty at best. Now I'm skipping your long drawn out explanation about mermaids because not only is it irrelevant to the conversation, but it turns into useless padding about Scotland. 
and then you move on to how you totally agree with the idea that fairies are totally bad shit for Black Butler, and even though I have issues regarding your inconsistent logic of how come it's okay for mermaids if there's real-life sightings but not fairies when they too have real-life sightings, I believe I've dwelled on your inconsistent logic enough to constitute its own quickie commentary. Oh my god, why is it so tiny and oh, I can see things that don't fit. I have issues. I have several issues, actually. I'm pretty sure in like the Victorian era, they would not have that capability of making striped shirts. Well, good for you, you're wrong. Yes, I just use an obvious media clip. Sue me. God, spiteful little bitch, aren't you? There's nothing inherently wrong with media clips, you know? The issue becomes if you overuse them, they're drawn out, or simply put, they're thrusted in there awkwardly and without a purpose. It can also become a problem if you're using a media clip for the sole purpose of making your point for you. But you know what, Doro? You did none of those things, so congrats. You're being a spiteful cum biscuit for the sake of being a spiteful cum biscuit. Those are not the words that I wanted to say, but fuck it, we're leaving them in anyway. Here's why she's wrong. The capability of making any clothes with stripes, including shirts, was a thing way before the Victorian era. They were important in Europe in the 13th century where it was a serious thing to wear stripes. The people who wore them at the time were considered social outcasts, such as prostitutes, the cripple, etc. Eventually, they became the signature prisoner clothes in the 1820s for America. Striped shirts also became a thing for the French Navy in 1858, which was about oh, 20 years after the Victorian era started. There is one character who can tie stripes into Black Butler, that character being Queen Victoria. While I was doing research on stripes, I found a picture of Queen Victoria's daughters, one of them clearly in a striped dress. So, yeah, striped shirts and other striped clothing wasn't impossible to have in the Victorian era. This has been the half-assed history of stripes with Toro. Hey, you know, Toro, that's great and all, but fiction and art styles. All right, let me explain. First with fiction. Here's where I actually started digging on the show because this is where it was the most important. Also, spoilers. Go to about this time frame if you want to watch Black Butler yourself. The rest of you ready? Alright. In the conspiracy and revenge arc, Queen Victoria was said to want to start a world war, and while real life Victoria had partaken in wars, her stance on war as a whole was pretty clear, being that she wasn't inherently a violent person unless the circumstances absolutely called for it. Meanwhile, in Black Butler, Victoria just wanted to start a war so she could rebuild from the ashes, something that real-life Victoria wouldn't do. Oh, but wouldn't that be seen as a last result in a world full of danger and wrongdoings? Yes, but you didn't see real-life Victoria rage war against South Africa when she lost two people and claimed it was a bad year all around. You also got the fact that BB Victoria died of rotting flesh, whereas while, yes, real-life Victoria died of a supposed illness, she could have also died by old age after all she was 80, and considering the global average life expectancy at the time was fucking 30 or 50 if you want to look at Britain, that's pretty impressive. But, bottom line is, they died of different causes, and at different ages. Like, I don't know how old she's supposed to be in the anime, but it's certainly not 80. The manga has her at 70 looking like this, which also shows to me that the show's writing is incredibly inconsistent too, so that's fun. Finally, that young Victoria, the one that dies and is clearly not 80 years old, yeah, she's later replaced by a fake Victoria, as in one that's not actually Victoria and probably didn't even have children in the world of Black Butler. So your real-life example of Queen Victoria's daughters is inconsistent given that the Queen Victoria in the anime probably didn't have children she was so young and the fake one was probably some demon of sorts. Of course, yes, that last point is more based on assumptions and hypotheticals, but given everything I've looked at, it's pretty safe to assume that that's the correct idea to go off of. Unless... You know, you can prove to me that Queen Victoria's daughters exist in the anime and use stripes instead of continuing to use real-life examples. Now the art style argument. Given that Black Butler is more of a darker, brooding art style, the world doesn't seem to have very many stripes to it, and in turn it would make sense for R&R to take issue with it given that the world may not actually have capabilities to make stripes on clothing just yet. Except, maybe... Oh, would you look at this! Stripes! From a character that's actually in Black Butler, which renders R&R's whole point invalid from the word go without having to use real life examples of people who could be fictional within a fictional world. How dare you do this to me? Oh, and there's another one. Toro, why are you bad at this? I haven't even watched the show and I can invalidate this point better than you can. That said, I'll be skipping your boots point because you do finally start arguing within the show of Black Butler without stretching a point so far it rips in the middle. Uh, now you're talking. Uh, 
I I don't know why, but there are just some characters in some fandoms that you don't want to have as a crush. Because it's just everybody has them as a crush. In Black Butler, it's always Sebastian, CL, C, CL, CL, however you want to pronounce it. It's like, they're always the main crushes, no matter what. Ain't nobody care about Bard over there. Ain't nobody. Nobody care about Finny. Nobody. Well, what do you expect? Sebastian and CL are the main focus of the show and manga. We got to see them way more than Bard and Finny. It was easy for people to pick up on CL and Sebastian's personalities because we've seen them all the time. Does that change the cliché-ness of it all? No. No, it doesn't. On top of that, if I can make a point against the common counter-argument of this problem, sure, we as the viewers would know Sebastian and Seal more than we do the other characters, but the fan character probably wouldn't. I mean, to be fair, the fan character probably wouldn't realistically be guaranteed to know any of the main characters within a series, but a fan character is supposed to be able to be inserted into a story with the main character, so realism in that sense doesn't really work here. But my point is, the fan character wouldn't know as much about the main character as the viewers would. So the fan character to automatically be head over heels for them, at least for a writing perspective, is quite unrealistic. And to say that people don't care about a certain character just because their fan base isn't as overbearing as others isn't right either. You just disregard the fans of Bard and Finny, even if it was for a joke. But if it's a joke, it's a fucking joke, you Nimrod. But even if it's not a joke, if the fan bases are small, that's her fucking point. It's more common to just see a fan character to be in love with the protagonist because they like them more. You just explained this in your last point. If it bothers you that much, then do something about it. Don't expect others to do it for you. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? r and is critiquing the character of Sarah Rose and how utterly cliché she is, pointing out issues that she has with the character. That's what an OC review is, and she's pointing out that this is a problem fan OCs tend to have. Critiquing it. Doing something about it, very akin to what you are doing with her and what I'm doing with you. And since that's the end of part one, let's move on to part two, because this train wreck needed to be in two parts, didn't it? Whee! Change your crush to somebody who's less, you know, less of the fan favorite. No, you may not understand what the word crush means in this context. It's not a mutual feeling between two people, just one. In short, her character has an infatuation with Sebastian, but he doesn't feel the same way. Even then, it's just one character as a crush. There's no issue to be had here. So telling her to change her character's crush under the guise of constructive criticism is wrong. Especially because the only reason that he came up with was Sebastian is a fan favorite. That's exactly like going up to Icy Hazard to tell her that she can't like Loki and Kylo Ren just because they're too popular. Sorry, Icy. It's the law. Besides, they're mine. Toro, there's a vast difference between a viewer on the outside of the world looking in and a character in-universe looking in. The vast difference being, we as the viewers will know everything that the show gives us about the characters. Their motives, their personalities, their struggles, their victories, and often their private moments. These are things we would see. What's a fan character gonna see regarding a scene where there's just two people in an empty room having a private conversation? Exactly. Nothing. The fan character would only know about as much as they would see. And yeah, technically as far as crushes go, I guess you could go off to something as superficial as how they look, but the point is, no. It's not like telling Icy that she can't like Loki or Kylo Ren because Icy, as a person, can like those characters for reasons entirely outside of just how they look. Sorry, go fuck yourself. Also, you both have shit taste in Husbandos. Uh, now you're talking! Now I'm pretty sure this is what she meant by her mermaid part of the OC in the Black Butler one. It's Sarah Splash, and it's with the Maker. I I don't know what this is, but what it's from, but I know it's a Maker. Well, I know what that is, and where to find it. And since I have respect for the person who made the doll maker, I'm going to show you how to find it. This is padding. Plain and simple. It doesn't argue the point, it doesn't explain an issue had with the point. All you're doing is arbitrarily showing us how to get to the maker that R and R stated herself existed. God, I fucking hate Okay, my little pony OC. Sarah Moonlight. I'm pretty sure in MLP they don't have human names. 
Crush Jim Hawkins. Right? Okay, roll with it. I have no idea who Jim Hawkins is. What? I have no idea who Jim Hawkins is. You don't know who Jim Hawkins is. Seriously? Oh, rants and reviews. How dare thee? How does one not know of thy lord, Jim Hawkins? Keep this in mind later, peeps. It'll be important later. Okay, um, I checked out the Jim Hawkins OC, and we'll get to him soon enough because he's not that far away. No! He is not one of her OCs. He's from an old piece of literature called Treasure Island. He belongs to Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Whoops, would you look at that? An AU version of the Treasure Island character who's related to Applejack and is a longtime friend of Sarah. Almost as if she had to make up those aspects in order to make that character fit in the world of My Little Pony because Lord knows Laura Foss and Hasbro ain't throwing them in. It's elementary school level of knowledge. But I wouldn't bring this up if she did one teeny tiny flea sized thing. Look slightly to the right. That should have given her a clue from where this Jim Hawkins belongs. Except, favorite Disney guy as a pony is fucking vague, you twit. That said, there's this link at the bottom of the page, but you know, such a shame RR states that she looks up what the fuck this character was, otherwise, you would have had a point, wouldn't you? Now, I'm a huge Disney fan, and I know for a fact that Disney has three versions of Treasure Island. Good for you. No one cares. Moving along, because your tangent about Treasure Island feels like it goes on for about as long as my lifespan and is totally irrelevant to the topic completely. Talent, she's a warrior mainly. She likes designing clothes, cooking, and art too. I'm very doubtful that in MLP they would have, like, wars that require, like, warriors and that such. Oh boy, pony shit. We all know how much I'm not a fan of this, but still we'll be able to point out how each of your examples are utter trash. Three, two, one, begin. Your Silver Quill example doesn't work as that's a complete outside conflict between two individuals who have a singular fight. Sure, the fight is big, but it's still just a brawl between two ponies. Almost like 1v1ing a person in the parking lot isn't a war despite the Dragon Ball Zenus. Season 1 begins with an evil pony returning from the moon to declare rule over the world. One villain which isn't even the main focus of the episode is Twilight learns how friends work. Great example, mate. I read 8 out of 8. Season 2 begins with the Lord of Chaos declaring shit to get fucking weird. Not really a war, per se. More bickering between six friends caused by magic that caused their personalities to reverse. Season 2 ends with a breach of security, a replaced princess, and a riot. There's a lot of guards, sure, hell, this is the closest we actually get to being a war. But even then it just winds up being the main team of six who do anything. I don't know if I really count that considering you don't call the X-Men fighting a room of goons a war. I suppose you could maybe call it asymmetric warfare, but I feel like even that's stretching it considering the size of the other side, the one that's not the changelings. Season 3 starts with a lost empire being found, and by extension, the ruling tyrants of said empire returns. This episode? A war? Fucking what? About as much as a war as a surprise party, maybe. The whole episode was built on keeping out of darkness and throwing a party. Wasn't any really fighting going on. Season 4 begins with two missing princesses and a magical forest taking over the home of the protagonist. Once again, not a war. In fact, this one's even less of a war than the previous one, as this was just an equestrian history lesson and then like 11 minutes of the main six returning the elements of harmony or some shit to a tree. Season 5 begins with communism and hypocrisy. Not a war. Nor were there any warriors seen within that episode. The episode focused on a town that overthrew its mayor with the only resisting factor being that mayor. Season 6 ends with the villains from the finale of Season 2, capturing the rulers and their friends, and it takes three reformed villains and the spawn of the main villain to save the day. Again, not really a war, more of a hostage situation. Ragtag team of four go to save a bunch of public figures. Hey. Don't even get me started on the Equestria Girls movies. Oh, I've certainly seen how much of a war those get to be. Spoiler alert, not at all. You seem to think big fight equals war. None of the Equestria Girls movies actually blows up into a war considering this is outside conflict that's not between two societies, just small groups of people. I spent six hours binge watching this show for these points. You're welcome. And my personal favorite example. Season 5 ends with the villain from the beginning of the season returning with a vengeance and a plan. Using the power of time travel, she goes back in time to prevent that one thing that brought the protagonists together as friends. 
Twilight follows her in an attempt to stop her from accomplishing her goal. After failing many times, she gets sucked back into the present. And what does she find? The dark side of past episodes. Two of them, at least, being a straight-up war. And if that wasn't enough, one of these wars having references to World War II, including Rosie the Riveter and Glenn Groh's He's Watching You poster. You know, that sounds like a good example. Actually, that sounds like a great example. Too bad this is AU and not actually a canonical perspective of what Vampire Princess or Ransom Reviews had in mind. Therefore, allowing no ground for your point to stand on because by your own wording, this is a what-if scenario of various episodes regarding how things could have happened if they all went wrong. Gee, when you're not using real-life examples for fictional worlds, you're using fictional examples within the fictional world for examples of said fictional world. How do you even do that? Are you still very doubtful that there's no room for a warrior character and wars are an impossibility in My Little Pony? I'm saving the obvious number one point for my final thoughts. She never said it was an impossibility, she just said it was doubtful, and in the world of My Little Pony and a canonical timeline, they haven't. Only in theoreticals and hypotheticals have they had any actual wars from given what you've told me, so therefore R&R's point against this OC still applies. Adventure Time, Sarah Fang again with the Maker, and I can tell. Relative, Marceline's sister. She does not look like a vampire. In the slightest. She looks like a human that has pointy ears. Gotta have that vampire. Age 18, loads of slashes. Crush, thin, loads of slashes. Species, half vampire, half mermaid. That is not a mermaid. That is a human with pointy Spock ears. Judging a character at first glance is fun. Wouldn't you agree on that, Ransom Reviews? Who needs to read a story beforehand? Just a picture of a character is them 100%. They don't change it after that. Way to not even address R&R's point. Good fucking god. First of all, you're implying that this character changes from what we've seen here to a half-mermaid. Where does it say she changes into this? Fucking where? Second, it's not like it's a personality trait, it's part of her character physically. We should be able to see the half-mermaid part of the character in the ref sheet. And even if she does change into said half-mermaid, you should have a reference sheet handy to the post-transformation form. Third, and this is more of a shot at Vampire Princess herself, if she's Marceline's sister, how the fuck is she half-mermaid? Marceline's dad was a vampire and her mom is a human, no mermaid involved. Just a picture of a character is them 100%, they don't change it after that. Just a picture of a character is them 100%. They don't change after that. Just a picture of a character is them 100%. They don't change after that. Just a picture of a character is them 100%. They don't change after that. Just a picture of a character is them 100%. They don't change after that. Just a picture of a character is them 100%. They don't change after that. Just a picture of a character. The joke's been going on for too long! We've entered the commentary material area! Abort! 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 Acknowledging the problem JPEG. Being self-aware that you're dragging on a joke for too long doesn't excuse the fact that you're dragging on a joke for too long. Also, as stated before, a lot of your examples are personality-based, not fucking physically-based. And a couple that are physical, they're such small changes that don't add half fucking mermaid to the equation. Yes, we are going after the joke. Fight me in the parking lot, we'll have a war. HIT THE RESTART BUTTON! Hey, look, oh. she's back where she belongs. Right. There's hardly any material that's actually good. It's all garbage. Uh, who is that a burn towards? Commentators? The material? Yourself? It's not that the joke isn't funny. I'm sure it was to you. You were laughing all the way to the bank with that, but it doesn't make sense. If you're wrecking the commentators, how? Commentators don't make the material, they just take it and hit it. If it's the material itself, uh, material isn't good. That's why we commentators hit it, so your joke doesn't even work on that basis. A Mew! No, 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 and no. You do not get to have a legendary Pokemon. Y you don't get that. No, I, d I don't care. And I know this is a world where in the video games you can beat the god Pokemon, but you still don't get to catch the legendaries in, like, in the anime, so on and so forth. 
Why did you just dedicate a segment to judging the choice of Pokemon? You're supposed to be reviewing the OC. Vampire Princess's preferred Pokemon doesn't matter. Actually, it can. It's kind of implied that those are the Pokemon Sarah Rose has in her party, given that those are the ones that are around the character. While it's not explicit about it, that's the idea one would obtain from looking at this. Now, that said, if that is what she's trying to imply, Latios. There's a trainer in the anime who uses it in battle. So technically, Sarah can have Mew, theoretically. If it wasn't that Vampire Princess was going for, fine, whatever. But we don't know that from the OC page, so we can only assume. Especially since there's no information about this character. As far as we know, this character is for one of the games. Could that be a possibility with you? I mean, I guess, but why would you make an OC based on the games when you can just play the games? A fan character's whole purpose is to insert a character that fits into a canon story. With the games, you basically play the role of the main character but go on your own story. Really, I mean, I guess the possibility is there, but what would be the point? Now because Toro skips the rest of the video, I too will be skipping through the rest of the video. For the Total Drama Island OC. I love how you just stated that the hair makes no sense. Yes, in a franchise that takes place in modern day where hair dye is a thing, the hair is an impossible thing for that character to have. Vampire? Pfft. Big deal. I saw a werewolf down the street just the other day. Its fur was rainbow colored though. That was the freakiest thing i ever seen. Where does the Total Drama OC say that it's a vampire? Where would it be implied? You are literally making up a double standard that doesn't exist in this particular instance. Shut the fuck up, she probably complained that it's a vampire too. And as for the Avatar OC, I would agree with you that she isn't the Avatar if she had any information about this character. So as far as we know, there's a different story for this character. But, as of rewriting the script, Vampire Princess did post a Legend of Korra OC, one that, surprise surprise, bends the four elements. Ooh, rent and reviews, just a few weeks shy of making a decent point. Except again, the four elements were surrounding the character implying that they had the ability, and fuck, if a week later it was confirmed, I would say that's a fucking good assumption to make. Since we go on to Toro's final thoughts after this, I'll be going on to my own. But before I do, there is a few more points I want to throw in here because, who oh boy, if this is what Toro's considers to be the point to hit home, I must cover it. And now, my opinion on Vampire Princess. Well, let me tell you what she's not. She isn't serious. I never picked up the vibe that she was. What I've been picking up is that she's either a little kid trying to act older, like most kids do online, or she's a troll trying to get a rise out of the OC community and ranters slash reviewers, or she's a parody of those who make bad OCs. Either one doesn't seem far-fetched. So, you don't get the idea that they're serious, and of course you bring up parody and troll, but you also bring up a kid who would be serious, and would be able to use this criticism as they grow up. What makes it even more apparent that she's one of these is that she has a journal entry telling her critics to fuck off. It's covered from head to toe with the typical cliches. She'll disable and delete comments, she'll block you if necessary, reporting anyone who breaks her rules, and of course calling her critics cyberbullies. That journal alone screams that she isn't serious. Or, or, or. You're a fucking idiot. You even say it's the typical cliches. Cliché, as in these things had to exist at one point and became so common that people associate people who make OCs like this with this kind of behavior. You're the whole reason your argument doesn't work. You are blatantly assuming that they are a troll to attempt to discredit everything Ransom Reviews had brought up. Now, Toro, not only that, but just because they're a parody or a troll, that doesn't mean you can't bring up good arguments against them. It's like Ponder said on Twitter, congrats, you acted like an idiot to people who actively search out idiots. Want a cookie? Same thing could be applied here. You make purposely bad OCs for people who actively search out bad OCs. You can still critique the OC and give criticism where it's due. Grant you the supposed troll won't get the criticism, but other people just might. It's the same thing with people who are big. Just because they won't listen doesn't mean your viewers won't. So what is the point anymore? We really have to stop pointing this shit out because it's really getting old and doesn't actually really do anything. 
Alright, so that's about the end of that, so final thoughts. I'll put it at the most basic I can. This has to be one of the worst videos I covered this year, and I've covered some pretty shit videos. And it's not because of the amount of bad points you make, nor is it the quality of how shit they are, but what bugged me was how persistent the glaring issues are. You speak slower than you need to with very little emotion to the point watching your videos are a chore. Your delivery also causes your jokes to fall flat. Fix that. God damn it, that's important. I also hate how you just go on and on about the CC in a spiteful manner while both showing how self-aware you are to your own problems, but not aware to know the actual common things people in the CC bring up, on top of not being self-aware to your own inconsistencies. Not only does that become a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it comes off as you just being a shit-eating cunt monkey for the sake of being a shit-eating cunt monkey. And finally, and I cannot stress this enough, learn how fictional worlds work. My god, this is the biggest fault with your videos. Fiction does not automatically equate to reality, and separate timelines don't fucking count under circumstances that are not given to you. Fictional worlds go by their own rules, they have their own history, and in turn, to argue shit like this, to argue fan OCs, use the worlds they're based in to argue. Otherwise, everything falls flat on its face because fictional worlds don't play by the rules of real life. I think that's about all I can say in this particular instance. I would still recommend working on your delivery, but other than that, be careful with what you do. You just crossed over into...